What's up, YouTubers? Today I thought I would investigate this whole reptilian overlord conspiracy that I see going around and to humor the possibilities that this actually is a truth. Like most mythologies, there seems to be an underlying truth. However, through word of mouth and the game telephone, things usually become distorted by the time they reach your ears. I mean, even in Dr. Seuss, I can find truth even though it's the most ridiculous notion of things ever imagined by a man, there are still truths found within the story itself. The underlying meaning behind the story gives us glimpses into human nature, and also things such as morals and ethical behaviors, which are presented through a ridiculous story. That being the case, I'm going to investigate this whole reptilian conspiracy in the same manner, and see if there might be some underlying truth to this whole story in which we can all apply and see beyond the myth that is the reptilians. So here we begin our investigation. Um, looked through a lot of different YouTube videos and this is the one that I've found that most eloquently describes the conspiracy theory in its fullest or the mythology I might say. And you know it's the top 10 things you should know about the reptilian conspiracy theory by top 10s. And we're starting off here by saying there's a reptilian hierarchy within the reptilian overlord system itself. And, you know, goes into how to spot a reptilian. And mostly they're Europeans. Um, and, you know, if you look at their skin through the light uh, at the correct angle, you can see green tinge and their eyes change colors. Um, and, you know, prominent figures throughout history and in our current times, which have been these reptilian overlords and they control world government. Uh, you know, again, how is it that you can spot a reptilian? What distinguishing characteristics do they hold that the rest of the population, you know, doesn't have? So... You know, it goes into their genetic differences, their blood differences, again, you know, different world leaders. Um, then it goes all the way back to the Bible. This has been going on since ancient times, these reptilian overlords. And angels came and, you know, freed mankind, but then Satan took back over and, you know, his reptilian rule again with the Dracos and the winged dragons. Um, and they again, you know, through Satan's influence and the Illuminati, um, meet once a week to control and discuss the economic flow of the world and they're a shadow government ruled by um, the Rothschilds and uh, then you know they all want the new world order and just goes on and on and on pretty much connects all conspiracy theories into like this one overarching super conspiracy theory so I was like all right I'm gonna humor this I'm really gonna humor this and give this a shot here and see what I can find out you know, um, firstly, I was thinking reptile. What's the one thing that comes to my mind when I think of reptiles? Well, anyways, I think of they're cold-blooded. You know, mammals, which humans are mammals, are warm-blooded. Um, that means they produce their own body heat. Any of you who go out and try and catch lizards or anything like that, um, lizards are, you know, cold-blooded, which means that they per they don't produce their own body heat. They have to obtain body heat. And so anyways, I found a paper discussing the thermal regulatory differences among racially divergent humans. And what this means is that ethnic, ethnicic um, diversities within people, and this is race, you know, black, white, Asian, mulatto, whatever, actually have different um, thermal regulatory factors um, in their physiology, in their bodies, you know, their... Um, uh, the way that they actually produce heat and absorb heat. And so I thought, all right, well, there's actually some evidence showing here that there are people that are possibly more cold-blooded than other people in regards to that they produce less body heat themselves. And, you know, they rely on other factors such as sunlight to produce this body heat for them. Um, and, uh, you know, it goes on to show that this is mainly prominent in indigenous species, you know, indigenous peoples. Um, and so I was like, all right, what other things can I find? Well, I found that the naked mole rat, um, is a really cold blooded mammal. Um, it's not really cold blooded, but in comparison to the rest of the mammalian kingdom, it's, 
pretty cold blooded. Um, also, this goat that became extinct um, because it's in, very similar to the dodo bird, you know. So, anyways, yeah, we have examples of you know diversity in the animal kingdom where certain mammals actually show a more cold blooded tendency in regards to their more warm blooded you know ancestors or distant relatives. So maybe this is the case within you know divergent subpopulations of humans. All right, so let's go and look at something else here. Now we're going to look at royal incest. Royal incest is something which is fairly common knowledge um, among you know anybody that really is into history. You marry up in your social class. If you marry a peasant and you're the queen, you're not doing yourself you know any good to maintain any status over. Um, the people that you rule. So what this study is saying that, um, you know, this leads to a direct association between high status and inbreeding. Um, so these people are breeding with other people of higher socioeconomic classes. And due to the fact that um, it decreases the amount of prospective husbands for these women, it actually creates a very limited subpopulation of people on the planet where they're all marrying within this subpopulation with each other. And they're all giving themselves specific genetic markers and they're only, you know, transporting this gene flow within the higher socioeconomic class or the 1%. Um, this is, you know, goes on to support a lot of the notions within uh, a lot of these conspiracy theories. Yeah, they actually, the royal, you know, ruling class might actually have a significant genetic difference than the 99% of the rest of the population. Um, this is again shown in another study where they say that most populations of animalia on planet Earth are panmictic, which means that their gene flow is random, um, given natural, you know, uh, the natural flow of genes and without natural barriers or obstacles such as, you know, an earthquake that creates a trench between two populations, which will create speciation. Well, anyways, it's saying that um, man is really the most particular when it comes to being non-panmictic or non-random, that man chooses other their mates very carefully in regards to um, social class, clan, caste membership, religious affiliation, and in addition various cultural regulations or taboos or prescribed mating systems. And man really is the only species that kind of does this. There are only a couple other species that do this and it is, you know, um, dogs and cats. However, they don't do this naturally. They do it because man is selectively breeding them, right? We selectively breed animals to give us the traits that we desire. And even though they're all within the same species, you know, dogs are, they show a huge difference. But there still is a difference in the genes between, you know, a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. However, the difference isn't great enough that they couldn't mate with each other. So anyways, this is this study is now showing a loss of genetic diversity from managed populations, um, which interacts the effects of drift, which is genetic drift, mutation, immigration, selection, and um, subdivisions of populations, which are isolated populations which will exhibit different characteristics in their genetic makeup. Um, and this these studies are mainly doing uh, dealing with um, zoos, and they're saying that. Because we are now controlling the populations of zoos, um, zoo animalia, they're no longer panmictic anymore. They're no longer random. We're selectively breeding these animals within the zoos, and they're actually showing less genetic diversity than animals within the wild are. Because, again, we're selectively you know, breeding these populations, and they're creating subpopulations. Um, again, this isn't necessarily always an advantage. It's just a byproduct of selective breeding. Um, and in most cases, really selective breeding like this actually gives disadvantages in concern to um, morphological traits or physiological traits. 
it makes them less able to cope with um, you know, their surroundings and less able to deal with disease and, and things to that extent. So it's not necessarily a benefit to the royal families of incest. However, it is a byproduct of incest. So this goes. This study is going on. One of the really prominent places where geneticists actually do their work is um, in Utah because there's isolated populations of Mormons which you know only really interbreed with other Mormons. Um, and so again, we're talking about um, ethnic, uh, ethnicic inequalities in health, and this is due to um, you know it's it's this one's pretty complicated um, because. It's saying that different races have different qualities of health, but it also relates socioeconomic class. Well, anyways, it's kind of saying that it may not necessarily be that specific races are less healthy, but it's more so their socioeconomic class. But the fact of the matter is that different races actually fall into um, a hierarchy of socioeconomic class, which makes them less healthy. Um, again, we're looking at um, the pattern and genetic diversity, uh, you know, between individuals. And this one's with humans, and it shows that the largest genetic diversity is between Africans. Um, they have the most um, large total amount of alleles, but then also the most unique alleles in comparison to either Europeans or Asians, which are you know, and have been a lot more selective in their societies between who it is that they breed with. So they're showing a lot less diversity within their populations. Um, and, you know, you can do a, a correlated study of how there's more of a hierarchy within European and Asian populations than there is within African populations. And so that's why they have greater diversity. They're less panmictic. They're less choosy about socioeconomic factors. Well, anyways... So this all kind of goes to show that maybe this study does have a little bit more credibility than we originally give to it. Um, that there actually might be differences genetically in the hierarchy of the socioeconomic class between the ruling class 1% of the population and the rest of the 99% of the population on planet Earth. Now whether or not there's some alien, you know, um, species or whatever but again I think that this mythology in itself has a lot of credence to really give to it you know we look at you know Bible documents that say and the gods came down and you know interbred with um, man because they found them attractive so this instance goes on to state that yeah well these people in this high socioeconomic class actually decided that hey I'm going to break the rules. I'm not going to marry into wealth. I'm going to marry somebody attractive. So in a sense, this superior population started breeding with, um, you know, slaves in a sense because they were physically attracted to them rather than attracted to wealth of another family. Um, and so then you get this whole thing about, oh, you know, the gods come down and they intermingle with mere man um, and create a subspecies of people. Like, you know, these, these texts I'll say, um, this whole thing relates back into the Illuminati and the all seeing eye, which goes back forever and ever and ever. And, you know, maybe they're more cold blooded because they've actually had to do less physical labor over the majority of this, um, speciation, this subpopulization, which has been occurring. So they have a genetic difference between the rest of the population in their ability to thermoregulate their body temperatures and so maybe they are actually more cold-blooded than the 99 percent of the rest of the population who knows you know there actually might be some credence to them being somewhat reptilian in a sense as well just like the you know that naked mole rat is considered cold-blooded relative to the rest of the mammalian kingdom even though it's not really cold-blooded but anyways um so there might be a little more credence however you have to look at it more as like mythology rather than these people presenting fact um and so that gets us back to, well, how does this actually apply? Well, you know, where do we go with this?